trade deadline is T minus one week away. And today on the Lockdown Blue Jay podcast, we'll take a look at a pair of teams in Illinois, as I think they'll be open for business this week and could well have the Toronto Blue Jays on line one. And in the first segment, we'll get set as the Blue Jays tonight looking to win their sixth straight game in starts when the Hound is on the mound. You are Locked On Blue Jays, your daily Toronto Blue Jays podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends. Craig Ballard, Locked On Blue Jays. Yes, indeed. Locked On the Toronto Blue Jays my entire life. My first year hosting the Locked On Blue Jay podcast. Toronto Blue Jay baseball, a big deal to me. Love the Toronto Blue Jays. Everything about, I mean, I mean, <laughs> don't love everything about them, I suppose, but love Toronto Blue Jay baseball, right? It's a big deal for me. So I thank you for spending part of your day talking Toronto Blue Jay baseball with me. The Locked On Blue Jay podcast, of course, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And so proud to mention that this is the only daily Toronto Blue Jay podcast. So tune in and join me on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday for Blue Jays Talk. Reminder that, of course, this season, all the Blue Jay games are available for you to take in on Sirius XM. And to the everydayers taking in the episode, this episode via the Locked On Blue Jay YouTube channel, hello and thank you for that. See some new subscribers lately. I want to shout out Kevin McKenzie, Daniel Hornacek, uh, Michael Glass, and White Russian 07. Thank you all for hitting that subscribe button. And to the everydayers making the Locked On Blue Jay podcast your first podcast listen every day, hello and thank you as well. Please uh, hit that five star rating and leave those comments about the podcast as well, please and thank you. A lot of trade talk today, but first, let's get into tonight's pitching matchup as Chris Bassett takes on Julio Urias. Chris Bassett, the hound, is on the mound. I'm loving Chris Bassett starts. I'm loving Chris Bassett as a Toronto Blue Jay. I feel like he has been everything that I thought and hoped he would be. I mean, everydayers will know when we've talked about Chris Bassett at the beginning of the season, we really diagnosed him as being a pitcher's pitcher. This guy's a professional pitcher. Whatever the legitimate routine is to do in between your starts to make sure you're ready for a professional outing in your next start, whatever that legitimate routine is, Chris Bassett is is at least read that book. He might even be writing that book. I just feel like he's always ready to take the ball. We saw him thrust into emergency action a couple Saturdays ago when Kevin Gosman woke up with that injury, but because he's from day to day, so prepared and so ready to take that ball in any sort of scenario, you're always going to get a really good, we got a great outing from Bassett. No surprise that game. I just feel like he's so veteran. I'm really like Chris Bassett. Have, have there been ups? Yes. Have there been downs? I mean, ups and downs? Absolutely. Yes. But I certainly think more ups than downs in particular lately on the season, Chris Bassett, 10 and five nifty little 3.92 ERA, anything in the threes, right? We're definitely going to take Blue Jays have won, and, and part of why I say Bassett been hot lately, Blue Jays have won Bassett's last five starts. And it's not the offense. The offense has been its usual underwhelming self. I mean, in those last five games that they've Bassett starts, the Jays have won all five. The offense is getting just over three runs per game. It's been like Kevin Gosman, like lack of support for Bassett lately. But Bassett's ERA in those five games at 2.57. I mean, he's been really bringing it, leading the Blue Jays to these victories. Bassett again in July had a month where his walks decreased. Going into this start, he only has four, in four starts in July, sorry, he only has two walks 19 strikeouts this month against two walks everydayers know that's when we've had criticism for chris bassett throughout the season that's what it's been too many walks well is that arrow pointed in the right direction at this point my goodness this will be bassett's 145th career start now would you believe just his second ever at dodger stadium his first came last season he was a new york met he got the loss he did surrender a pair of home runs. One was to Cody Bellinger, who, of course, is not there anymore. The other to Zach, Zach McKinstry. And now, Chris Bassett tonight and the Toronto Blue Jays, they are opposed by Julio Urias. Now, Urias last, I mean, this season, 7-6. and six, ERA is over 5. Julio Urias is the L.A. Dodgers version of Alec Manoa. This guy, in 2021... Urias finished seventh in Cy Young voting. Last season, 2022, finished third in Cy Young voting in the National League. Does that sound familiar? Who finished third in American League Cy Young voting last season? Well, it was Alec Manoa, the Toronto Blue Jays, and, and Urias having a, a similar, you know, completely unrecognizable season. His uh, ERA last season, Julio Urias, his ERA was the best in the league. This season, it's over five. It's over five. I mean, he has struggled mightily in 2023. Now, 
is worth mentioning that most of Arias' struggles this season have come on the road. Uh, on the road, his ERA is just under eight. Now, at home, going to have to, I mean, <laughs> going to have to glass half empty this for Toronto Blue Jays because at home, Arias has been awesome. He's 5-1, and 2.15 ERA. And is that good? 2.15 ERA for Julio Arias at home so far this season. Oh, boy. The Dodgers, this will be Arias' seventh start at Dodger Stadium this season. In the previous six, the Dodgers have lost just one. They're five and one. So, oh boy, oh boy, some some scary things uh, are going on there. Absolutely, yes. Now, we're going to know early on how things are going to go in this game. That is one thing that has plagued Urias no matter where he's been, home or away. When he's gotten in trouble, it's been early and often. 14 starts this season for Julio Urias. He's allowed 18 first inning runs. That's where we want to see the Toronto Blue Jays should I call for a Springer Dinger right now? I mean, I don't know, but that's that's where we need to see the Toronto Blue Jays really jump on a rise. We, we know that Bo, uh, Bo is struggling mightily lately. Hopefully, he'll, he'll get something going in the first inning, and the Blue Jays can jump on a rise tonight. Blue Jays 10-7 and seven this season so far versus lefties, and they've been hot. They've been winning a lot of games lately versus lefties. That's remarkable. You know, every day as we remember, we, we deep dive this last week where we took a look at how the rest of the division was doing against lefties. And the rest of the division is absolutely smashing lefties, complete domination. The rest of the league, what I think they're 60 and 28, the rest of the AL East, I believe, if I remember correctly, 60 wins, 28 losses against lefties this season. So that 10 and 7 for the Blue Jays pales in comparison, yes. But when you look at where the Blue Jays came from, Last season, the Blue Jays won just 12 of the 30 games they played against left-handed starters. That was by far the worst in baseball. I think literally the Washington Nationals had a worse record, but the Nationals were the worst team. I mean, they, they were awful, right? So of contending teams, of playoff contenders last season, nobody was even close to being as bad against lefties as the Toronto Blue Jays. So this 10-7 and seven record and having won you know, a few starts in a row against lefties, I will take it. Could Brandon Belt be in the lineup tonight? I mean, on the surface, you would think, no, right? Three for 18 this season with eight strikeouts against lefties, but seven for 22 in his career versus Julio Arias. Remember, Belt, of course, came from the unbalanced schedules with the San Francisco Giants playing the Dodgers all the time. He's faced Arias many times. Seven for 22, three doubles and a pair of home runs. Now, seven for 22, quick math tells us there that's 15 outs. Well, of the 15 outs, 11 have been strikeouts. So it hasn't been one-sided, right? Like Arias has gotten Belt as well, but just... And if you're the Toronto Blue Jays, I certainly get why you wouldn't want Brandon Belt in the lineup. He's just been atrocious against lefties this season, but again, does have an interesting track record against Urias. One, th one I mean, really odd thing, I think, and for me anyway, I found this odd. The entire Blue Jays infield, the entire Blue Jays infield will be facing Julio Arias for the first time today. Now, the entire outfield has faced him many times. Not with success. I mean, just four for 26 with nine strikeouts. But so, oh my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I just think it's so funny and just, just ironically funny that the entire infield has never faced Arias. The entire outfield, tons of, tons of um, uh, experience. Not, not a ton of, not a ton of success, unfortunately, but a ton of experience. Now, what will we see from Arias tonight? He's got that four-seamer fastball. He features that. Blue Jays will see a lot of slurves as well. They'll see the changeup and the cut fastball mixed in. But really, for Arias this season, anything straight, so the four-seamer or the changeup, those are the pitches that are getting dealt with. He's missing his spots left, right, and center. So now those are straight pitches that major league hitters are certainly on the major league level because they're able to deal with straight pitches like that. So if you're the Blue Jays tonight... If you're up there, of course, with two strikes, obviously have to protect. But if you're before two strikes and you're looking for something, you're, you're looking to pick out a pitch to do damage on, if you see that spin where you know it's something that's going to have some movement on it, go ahead and take it. Wait for that straight as an arrow fastball or that straight as an arrow changeup and go ahead and do damage. Coming up on the Lockdown Blue Jay podcast, we'll take a look at a few teams in Illinois that I'm interested in that I do think will be open for business as the trade deadline now T minus one week away. Wow. First, I wanted to mention that buying tickets to your favorite sporting events or favorite events in general, right? It shouldn't be stressful. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for your sports, your music, your comedy, your theater, you name it near you. With killer deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun you're about to have. I've used game time a few times, should I say several times, at least a few times uh, this year going to Toronto Blue Jay games. And it's the ease of use that was important for me. It's how I got the Danny Jansen and Jordan Romano bobblehead, which I love. So thank you, Game Time. But I mean, you, you see the image of your seats before you 
before you click the purchase and to click the purchase it's two clicks and the tickets come right to your phone i mean it's all very very user friendly that's something that's important to me because I'm never going to be, I'm never going to be, you know, the one you're going to call for, for tech help, right? So I really like this game time app and I really appreciate as well the game time guarantee. Now the game time guarantee means that you're always going to get the best price because if you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit you back 110% of the difference. I mean, it's the fastest growing ticketing app in the country for a reason. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On MLB. That's going to get you twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Now, again, create an account and redeem the code Locked On MLB for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Trade deadline rapidly approaching, and I do not think that the Toronto Blue Jays can big game hunt. As the return asset would have to be something like a Ricky Tiedemann, right? And, and I'm just I'm, I'm a hard no for that. I think that the Blue Jays at the trade deadline more looking to sort of smooth out some of the edges. I could see a, a Kevin Biggio being involved in a deal. I could see a Santiago Espinal being involved in a deal on Nate Pearson, a Sam Roberts, maybe a U.S. for Zulueta. But the, the this Toronto Blue Jays organization, I, I just they, they don't seem to have a bunch of guys again outside of Ricky Tiedemann that will be really sought after for for big game hunting. When I say big game hunting, I mean the big players that still have you know time left on their contract. I think there'll be a, a fine line in the approach here between the all in and and there is some all, all all sorry some all in easy for me to say there are some all in aspects of the 2023 Toronto Blue Jays when you consider Matt Chapman, Whit Merrifield, Kevin Kiermaier, and Brandon Belt. That's four of your nine starters. This could be the final season as a Blue Jay for all four of them. And now you have to balance that with still having, even, even if you lose all four of them, you're still going to have a legit contention window for, for years to come here, right? Because of the Vladdy and Bo era. So Mark Shapiro and in particular Ross Atkins have some delicate work to do here. And I, I, I mean, you can't go all in my opinion. Anyway, if, if you're Shatkins, you can't go all in this season if it's going to damage the next few kicks at the cans over the next few seasons that I do think this organization is set up to, to have. So I think the Blue Jays were looking, uh, looking for upgrades and depth via players who are impending free agents. Those sort of asking prices, I think, will be um, you know significantly more doable for the Blue Jays and their unfortunately low-ranked farm system. That takes us to Chi-Town. Let's start with the Cubs. Six games behind in the loss column in the lonely NL Central, so... I mean, you could see if they would consider themselves in it, but I still get the feeling that they're going to end up being sellers. I, I, I definitely think the Chicago Cubs will be a, a team that is open for business in over this next week. Now, back in late June, Everdares will remember right here on the Lockdown Blue Jay podcast, we talked about the fact that ironically, a trade with the Cubs for Marcus Stroman and Julian Merriweather would be great for the Toronto Blue Jays. And since then, I've actually heard some Stro show rumors involving the Toronto Blue Jays. So could there actually be smoke here? Hmm. Marcus Stroman, let's take a look. His ERA is just over three. He's got the eighth best ERA in baseball. His 3.0 war is the fourth best for any pitcher in baseball. Very likely a free agent at the end of the season. He does have a player option. It's going to be in the mid 20s for mid 20 millions for 2024. But because he's had such a good season here, I just think he's likely going to decline that and look for something longer term. Now, over Marcus Stroman's last five starts, that's a stinker versus the St. Louis Cardinals. Then he gives up five and a loss to the Cleveland Guardians. Gives up four runs, four hits on four walks in just five innings to Milwaukee. Then an absolute beauty at home versus the Boston Red Sox. And then the last time out, a stinker versus the Cardinals again. So four of his last five starts have been absolute stinkers. But I still think that overall he's bringing it in 2023. And I think Marcus Stroman would welcome the bright lights of a pennant race in general, but can you imagine the Stro show and the bright lights of a pennant race repping the Toronto Blue Jays again? I think he would love it. Now, going forward, let's look at some specifics here. This season, the Stro show has faced the Texas Rangers. They're on the Blue Jays schedule in September. He dominated them. This season, the Stro show faced the Oakland A's on the Blue Jays schedule in September. He dominated them. This season, the Stro show faced the Washington Nationals on the Blue Jays schedule to close out August. He dominated them. This season, the Stro Show faced the Philadelphia Phillies on the Blue Jays' schedule mid-August. He dominated them. This season, the Stro Show faced the Tampa Bay Rays. It was a complete game, absolute gem. And we know that six of the last nine games for the Blue Jays this season are against said Tampa Bay Rays. Man, 
He's not pitched well versus the New York Yankees. I will absolutely say that, and, and in particular has struggled at Yankee Stadium, where we know the Blue Jays will will have some important stretch run games here. But I just think Marcus Stroman feels like a pitcher that would indeed stamp up for the Toronto Blue Jays down the stretch. And as a side note here, I mean, am I wrong in thinking it might be a little bit of a boost as a teammate for Alec Manoa? I mean, if you've seen Marcus Stroman, he's been very vocal. I haven't seen many players as vocal as, as uh, Marcus Stroman has been this season in support of the big Puma, Alec Manoa. I think Manoa would welcome him with open arms. That's two personalities that bring the party to the table. I actually think they could be really good teammates together. Marcus Stroman, he's had issues with the Blue Jays front office in the past. That's totally true, right? Let's acknowledge that. Let's talk about that. The, one of the biggest problems was with how the arbitration hearing went down. Well, my guess is Marcus Stroman has been spoken to several times by several different players and they and now understands that is the business of baseball. You could still hate that that is the business of baseball, but it has certainly nothing to do with Mark Shapiro and Ross Atkins. I mean, how they conducted was how every regime conducts business there. So I would hope some of the stank that Marcus Stroman felt from that is is now lessened at this point. And of course, Stroman's huge issue with the with the regime here is is he he's tweeted about this. He's openly spoken about this a few times. He doesn't feel like they'd be commit that they do what it takes to be committed to build a winner. Well, since then is the Hyunjin Ryu contract, the George Springer contract, the the Bassett, the Gosman, right? All the building that's been done since then, the trade deadline last season, bringing in Whit Merrifield, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And wouldn't Marcus Stroman think? that a team adding Marcus Stroman at the trade deadline is very serious, very serious, very committed to making the sort of moves to win. Marcus Stroman, hey, you, he's got that ego, right? He's he's going to think, and, and rightfully so. Hey, don't get me wrong on this. Rightfully so. He's going to know, he's going to understand that any team trading for him at the trade deadline is, of course, serious about making a run at the championship in 2023. So even the previous issues Stroman's had with the Blue Jays regime, I think, are very, though those fences seem to be very mendable to me. Julian Merriweather. Now, Julian Merriweather, just like Stroman, probably going to be a free or, or sorry, uh, affordable going forward. Stroman going to be a free agent very likely going forward. Well, Julian Merriweather's just going into his arbitration seasons. He's had 47 career appearances coming into this season. He's already had 43 appearances in 2023. He's been getting the job done for the Chicago Cubs. On the surface, you might not be blown away with with his stats, but I want to I want to deep dive something here now. Julian Merriweather's had three appearances this season versus the Milwaukee Brewers. He's only totaled two and a third innings pitched because he just can't get them out. In those two and a third innings pitched, eight runs on six hits, five walks in that barely over two innings of work. The Milwaukee Brewers three times this season have absolutely smoked, absolutely smashed Julian Merriweather. Well, that's not an issue here. In Canada, we don't play the Milwaukee Brewers. Ron Blue just don't play the Milwaukee Brewers going forward. And outside of the Milwaukee Brewers... Julian Merriweather's made 40 appearances for the Cubs this season. His ERA is 2.45. I am going to say that again. Outside of the Milwaukee Brewers this season, Julian Merriweather has made 40 appearances for the Chicago Cubs. His ERA is 2.45. Is that good? Is that going to work? In those 40 appearances, 40 and a third innings pitched, 56 strikeouts. Pardon? Yeah, 40 and a third innings pitched, 56 strikeouts. Basically, the Julian Merriweather that we all fell in love with when he made his debut at Yankee Stadium, you know, back in the day there, that's who he has been all season long outside of against the Milwaukee Brewers. That's who he's been this season for the Chicago Cubs. Whew, very affordable as well. Now, could you expand the trade and really start talking something big as well? What about Cody Bellinger? Cody Bellinger, same idea. This is an impending free agent. Now, Cody Bellinger is swinging the bat. Holy moly. 319 average, 369 on base, 918 OPS. All of that would lead the Toronto Blue Jays. All of that would lead the Blue Jays. Uh, you know what? Maybe the, the 319 would. The 369 and the 918, I guess I'd have to check that, but it'd all be amongst the Blue Jays' leaders. That's for absolute certain. And Cody Bellinger has shown that he's not a guy you have to platoon. Like, you know how weird we are about Dalton Varshow against lefties? Well, my goodness. Cody Bellinger this season's hitting 352 with a 408 on base, pardon me, and 1,067. That's his OPS versus lefties. Wow. <laughs> wow. I mean, I pop emoji. 
Cody Bellinger this season has 14 home runs, seven versus lefties, seven versus righties. He's had half as many at-bats against lefties than the righties. Still has as many home runs. He's been awesome. So you don't even need to worry about a platoon scenario. You've got Bellinger out there. Now you've got a four-man outfield of Cody Bellinger, Kevin Kiermaier, George Springer, Dalton Varsho, all rotating with each other. And remember, with Bellinger being excellent versus lefties, and Kevin Kiermaier's done well against lefties this season as well. So even though it's three left-handed hitters and one right-handed hitter, you still would have the level of flexibility you would hope for with your four outfielders. And now you have the ability to keep them all fresh as well. I know a lot of Toronto Blue Jay fans would want Ian Happ in here, but I've never been an Ian Happ fan myself, and he just signed a three-year extension worth $61 million as well. Again, I just I don't think Blue Jays are looking to uh, add on salary like that. It's going to have to be someone with expiring contract. But the Stroh Show, Julian Merriweather, and could something work with Cody Bellinger as well? Hey, Chicago Cubs, if you're open for business, my gosh, there's a lot there that I like. Now let's head south to look at the Chicago White Sox. Chicago, the Shy Sox, I mean, they, they thank the baseball gods every day for the Kansas City Royals, or they would be in last place. The White Sox would be in last place in that awful American League Central if it wasn't for the Royals. The White Sox, 20 games below 500. I mean, surely looking to make some roster changes, a.k.a. trades, right? Now, Liam Hendricks, of course, is going to be the top dog target. Would love to add Liam Hendricks. There's, you know, there's, there's a lot of due diligence you need to do there. Not only is he coming back from beating cancer, <laughs> Massive applause. We love you, Liam Hendricks. Way to go on that. But, I mean, what an ordeal that would have been. And then he's since got hurt, right? He's not even uh, pitching. Well, he's he's pitching in, in the minor league level right now, trying to get back to the big league level. But you'd have to do a lot of due diligence to make sure that he's going to be Liam Hendricks, Liam Hendricks. Because if he is, now the back of your bullpen is Liam Hendricks, Jordan Romano, Eric Swanson, and Tim Meza. And to bridge to get to those guys, you've got Chad Green, Trevor Richards, and Jimmy Garcia. And you know me, I'm still hoping for Zach Pop. I'm still hoping for Ricky Tiedemann in this bullpen to be contributors as well. I mean, that is a an incredible, incredible bullpen. So certainly if Liam Hendricks has got to be the showstopper there for the Chicago White Sox, but again, a lot of due diligence needs to be done. Have to be sure he's going to get back to being Liam Hendricks, Liam Hendricks. I would also be looking at Louis Giolito. The big fellow was a 6'6", a starter for the White Sox there. 3.79 ERA. 2.8 war on the season for Giolito. That that would be tops. Kevin Gosman's a 2.1. Let's j- just to put it in perspective there. So Giolito has had his moments. He's an impending free agent. So you know, right, right, on, right in line with what I think the Blue Jays will be looking for because that that really drives down the the, ask, the return asking price. Now, uh, uh, Lucas Giolito in 2023, the results have absolutely been mixed. A lot of extreme ups, a lot of extreme downs. But I want to mention that some of those extreme highs or games against American League East foes. He pitched very well against the Boston Red Sox. He had a gem against the Tampa Bay Rays, and he had an absolute gem at Yankee Stadium versus the hated New York Yankees. Giolito, I like his stuff. I mean, he generates fast. He generates strikeouts with his fastball. He generates strikeouts with his changeup. He'll get you on his slider. Uh, there, there's a lot to like, in my opinion, for Lucas Giolito. And sticking with Chicago, you know, expanding this trade, how about a Joe Kelly? How about a Joe Kelly for the bullpen for this Toronto Blue Jays? I mean, Joe Kelly's personality and his 100 mile per hour heater. I mean, that's that's worth the price of admission. Uh, Joe Kelly, remember when the White Sox were in town a couple of weeks back? Joe Kelly raved about the Rogers Center renovation, so I think he'd be very excited to be to become a Toronto Blue Jay. Now, overall, not having a good season, but you could chalk that up to the fact that he was hurt. He just came back the other day from a long uh, injury list stint, pitched one inning. Now he did give up a double, but. Struck out Byron Buxton swinging on a 99.9 mile per hour heater. Struck out Ryan Jeffers looking on a 100 mile per hour heater. And then to end the inning with no damage done, struck out Michael A. Taylor looking on a 99.7 mile per hour fastball. Joe Kelly packs a legit heater. That fastball, absolutely legit. And again, with that personality, boy, I could see Joe Kelly really fitting in for a stretch run for the Toronto Blue Jays. In next season, he's he has a there's a team option on his contract for nine point five million. So, I mean, that would be pricey. Joel Kelly would have to do really well for the Blue Jays to pick that up going forward. But either way, it, you see, it's a team option. So, if the Blue Jays didn't want to eat that amount of salary, or things just flat out didn't work out with Joe Kelly, the Blue Jays can move off of him very, very easily. Could something with the White Sox be expanded to include an Eloy Jimenez? I personally would love that. I just think it's really unlikely. Now, hearing a lot lately, right, about Tim Anderson. Tim Anderson having a really poor 2023, but 
I think it could be almost like Whit Merrifield last season when when the Blue Jays acquired Whit Merrifield last season. The 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 knee jerk reaction was that it wasn't a good move because a lot of fans were just looking at the at, at his stats that season. Whereas I was contending that the Blue Jays not only have they been trying to get their own, you know, poor man's version of Whit Merrifield the entire Shapiro and Atkins era and every day is no, we've looked at this in, in great details, like 23 guys, something like that, that they tried to have be their poor man's Whit Merrifield. Now they get the actual Whit Merrifield and Whit knew that entire season wasn't really looking to be traded from Kansas city, but knew it was going to happen. So really he knew all season long that he was playing with one foot in Kansas city's door and then one foot out the door and it was going to be forced out at the trade deadline. So really mentally, was it Whit Merrifield, Whit Merrifield last season? I don't think so. Could the same be said about Tim Anderson this season? And in particular, when you look at how Tim Anderson has really perked up lately, because I think he sees the writing on the wall. He's almost done with the Chicago White Sox team. He's going to go to a playoff contender. So business is going to pick up for him. And, and Tim Anderson is the kind of guy who needs business to pick up. He needs things on the line to perform. And when things are on the line, when the lights are brightest, Tim Anderson has performed in his career. This guy's hitting 300 in July, so I think he's trying to audition for for playoff teams. From a Blue Jays standpoint, in his career, he's mashed lefties. That sounds great. And I mentioned the bright lights and Tim Anderson. Well, he's played seven games in his career in the playoffs. In five of those seven playoff games, Tim Anderson has three hits. That's fantastic. That's absolutely fantastic. His playoff OPS is over 1,000. Tim Anderson is when and it's a motivated and inspired Tim Anderson. He's been really good now a career shortstop, right? So, you know, that's not going to work, but he's played like literally right now. I was going to say he's played a couple of games. That's literal. Like he's literally played two games at second base. I think over the next week, we'll see Anderson at second base a lot more as, as the White Sox try to expand his, uh, uh, his value on, on the trade market. And if the Blue Jays, were to acquire Tim Anderson, I definitely think that's where he would go as a second baseman. And it would just, I mean, I mentioned Whit Merrifield. Well, it would not surprise me to see someone like Tim Anderson get really caught up and quickly too, just like Whit Merrifield, in being engaged and excited about being a Toronto Blue Jay because this fan base is that good. Now that's a wrap for Tuesday's Locked On Blue Jay podcast episode. We were packed today looking at those trades, but we will get the trivia on tomorrow's episode, Trivia Tuesday on a Wednesday, right? But it'll still be a lot of fun. It's Remember now, this past weekend, former Toronto Blue Jays Fred McGriff and Scott Rowland were inducted into the Hall of Fame. So our trivia this week is about their time with the Toronto Blue Jays. And a reminder that tonight's Blue Jay game is an, another late one, yes, but it is available on Sirius XM. Now, for now, keep it locked to the Locked On Podcast Network and check out Sully hosting Locked On MLB. Go Jays go, and we'll talk tomorrow.